Great. Now that we're out of the woods, so here we are. John, as, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I must say, really, it's a privilege to be here today. <clears throat> this, although this is the second Ignite uh, event that we've had, uh, it's really it's good to see how Sadila has moved on five years ago and still extremely going strong, also specifically with this movement in terms of digital humanities, DH, Ignite, etc. Now, you may see that the, I was given a, a title, Big Vision, but I think it's a bit uh, presumptuous at a certain point, really, so I tried to downscale it a bit to something like context uh, and some vision as, this, as such. And if we look at the, the diagram, because that is actually what digital humanities is, the diagram which we have in front of you, with, which comes, originates from Willard McCarthy and Harold Short, two very important scholars in the field. They actually started off with the H at King's College in London, and they also presented the first doctoral degrees in digital humanities, and still an extremely uh, expanding organization at where they are. But here we see DH is kept encapsulated in what we have here on this, on this slide. Uh, all the different disciplines, sub-disciplines, but all linked in one way or the other to a methodological commons. The same way to approach the, the data. The data, whether it's in history, whether it's in performance studies, law, philosophy, you can go right through. Because the interesting thing is, as we all know, language is a carrier. It's a carrier of our being as such. So given the nature of our group here, and also those uh, not here with us, but virtually here with us, uh, where we are mainly from the humanities and, computer and social sciences today, uh, and Bearing in mind that we're all from different levels, uh, beginners, certain persons in a more advanced way, from different uh, occupations, university staff, librarians, entrepreneurs, etc. Given this as a background, this will, uh, colleagues, not be a technical discussion. It's going to be a plain what uh, Anella asked me to do, a pep talk or something like that. So let's keep it as a pep talk to that point. So it will not <coughs> be on the, a talk on the technical issues, but rather we hope with this to widen our perspectives on DH as a movement, as it has been around for quite many years uh, abroad. Secondly, we would like to attract attention to the field uh, and getting involved for those who are not yet involved. And then moving up some levels of participation. Those of you who have been in the field for some time as well also have to share, and normally, and this is an important point that was also mentioned here today, sharing, 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 and that's what counts. What counts. And then it is also the aim, as it is the aim of this specific meeting, uh, to participate, to learn from one another, and to, to uh, communicate in a way as building digital humanities. So I think let's move on to the, and I only have two slides. with five questions to that. And the questions may be varied as I, as I go on. Uh, question is, why are we here today and for the next few days? My answer would be, and I think you'll all agree with that, it's because we're all in the knowledge game. That's what it's about, knowledge. Uh, as academics, as scholars, Entrepreneurs, we are not interested in just regurgitating the 
old known knowledge. No, that's, that's not what it is. Rather, we'd, as researchers, as academics, we're interested in getting the, to the edge of knowledge and moving those edges, those boundaries. But then, again, that will also raise another question. What is, what is knowledge? And yes, I'm not going to go into any philosophical discussion of what knowledge is, or supposed to be is, or even the concept knowledge and or information as such. But from a pragmatic point of view, uh, I would rather focus on the manner in which we get access to knowledge or access to information. And there are at least two modes of getting these, uh, this access. The one is indirect, indirectly through experiences, through feelings. I think um, thinking a child will hopefully not touch an open flame twice, if you see what I mean, or the feeling on, on this. And then directly, we can get access, obviously, to knowledge directly through text, speech, sound, and visual images. And all of these in different formats, but we'll get to that point as well. So, the second point would be, how did we get here? Not here by GPS physically, yeah? but how did we get here in terms of DH in the DH domain. And as alluded right at the beginning, the point of departure is language. Language in its broadest sense. We know that there's been different, there are different approaches to the studies of language for centuries already. Theories, descriptions, explanations, theoretical models, etc. However, that's not applicable here today. What is important and applicable is how language is constructed in conveying knowledge. And to get to this point, some form of intervention, in, uh, intervention sorry, some forms of inter intervention are required to analyze the phenomenon of language. And language as a phenomenon tested in a wide and representative domain. Already in the 1950s, 1950s, computational linguistics originated, mainly, mainly in the United States at that point in time, uh, trying to get computers to translate different languages into English. In terms of the world situation at that point in time, you can guess which languages they, the Americans wanted to change into English. Uh, the main one was Russian at that point in time, actually. Uh, then, 56 years ago, in 1967, <clears throat> there was a landmark publication in this regard, specifically the work of Kuchera and Francis. Uh, so called, the book was published as Computational Analysis of Present Day American English. And the work was based on a corpus, a corpus of text data of the so-called Brown Corpus, which is a compilation of about a million American English words from a wide variety of sources. And I'll get back to this concept of a, wild, a wide range of sources uh, a bit later. But this corpus eventually was subjected to a variety of computational analyses and then combined with elements of linguistics, image, language, teaching, psychology, statistics, and sociology. Now, it's interesting that that was in 1967. Uh, incidentally, at that same time, for those of you who are in, the, in languages, uh, is the same time, 1968, when Chomsky and Halley brought the sound pattern of English uh, a monumental work of theirs, which also changed, totally changed the way in which linguists look theoretically at language. But that was basically at the same point in time. So, from the, the growth of corpus linguistics, 
it expanded exponentially uh, in various and various uh, associations, academic associations, became part of this growing uh, domain, as was the Association for Computational Linguistics, and then also the Association for Computers and the Humanities. And in 1973, the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing was formed in London, quite predictable, uh, and eventually nurtured the European Association for Digital, U Digital Humanities, the so-called EADH. But then, a few years later, in 2005, 2005 rather, uh, this European Association joined the organization Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, which currently comprises 11 countries involved, organizations in countries involved in this, 11 of that, including the Digital Humanities Association of Southern Africa. Southern Africa, as it is, spread wider than South Africa as, as such. Uh, so, that's a bit of a history on that. So, here we are today uh, with DASA in its synergetic association with Sanilar, Escalator, and the second uh, DH Ignite uh, event. So, looking at what resources do we have, or do we have access to, for instance, uh, given the, that DH is a relatively young and, shall I say, underdeveloped, underdeveloped in South Africa, uh, it does have certain benefits. Uh, as we try to create an environment which is conducive to engage young entrants to the field and support those who are already involved in the field. And some of the benefits, or the main benefit I would say in this sense is that we can piggyback on experiences of international scholars in the field as it is reflected in literature, which is open to all of us. Learn from them who have been there for, for some time. I think we find ourselves very much in the same situation <clears throat> as the developers of the, in the domain of digital or, or human language technologies uh, two, two decades ago, uh, where we tried to develop for African languages, for the local languages, automatic speech recognizers and speech synthesizers. Uh, we learned quite a lot from the mistakes, but also the successes of our international colleagues. So that's, that's what it's all about. Furthermore, if we speak of resources, there are the uh, normal academic publications. And in particular, I would just like to mention two of them. Uh, academic journals, main academic journal as we have it is uh, Digital Scholarship in the Humanities. It is uh, of the European Association of DH that covers all aspects of computing and information technology applied to arts and humanities research. But also, second one, don't forget this. It's a journal of the Digital Humanities Association of Southern Africa, which is online, available, and since 2017. Then, another resources that we got could have Google Research for DH Tools. We'll give you something like 23,400 results in a few seconds. Resources. Uh, some of them will become apparent also during this, this meeting as, as we continue. Uh, software uh, such as Voyant, Tapor, etc., which are indices of resources. Google, a Google search, furthermore, for text resources, you will find Kaggle, Kaggle.com, where over 90,000 public data sets are available in various formats. This is the, the iconic platform, uh, Project Gutenberg, 
which is a collection of over 60,000 free e-books, language-free e-books. You can get it, you can use it. Then we have data sets from a variety of disciplines in Google dataset search. And then obviously from those of a more technical nature, GitHub, uh, data for researchers and developers in the field of DH. And then another one in terms of local languages, uh, for local language resources, and this is not a commercial, but I could say try Sadilar. Amongst others, there are other issues, there are other groups as well, but Sadilar is there exactly for the purpose that we need this. Data, data, and data. And Sadila are focusing as the official uh, organization in the, in the country, which is supported for, by government for quite a number of years, we hope still in, in the future. And it will all depend also, may I just put it this way, is on the way that you use those resources. Uh, if at the, at the end of the day, and I think Juan, you may uh, confirm this, we will be looking at KPIs, uh, performance indicators. And one of the things, looking at what the Saddle are doing, is are the resources being used? And the resources are there. Please feel free to use these resources, but more than that, add to these resources and get your, your stuff also online and share it with, with colleagues. Right, then this brings us to the next point. regarding research <clears throat> and driving projects. Now, to answer this question uh, in terms of research, uh, I think it's, it's, it's general knowledge. Just go to the, go to the web. And uh, there's an ever-growing source of publications, examples, uh, lists, uh, indices, then there's the Digital Humanities Quarterly. Please have a look at that. Digital Humanities Quarterly, which is high quality academic journal, which has been around since 2007. Though I must mention two other publications, which are very, with more recent publications, which are very uh, prominent in this area. 2018 Research Methods for the Digital Humanities of Levenberg, Nielsen, and Reims. I repeat, research method, methods for digital humanities. And these forms, we can, we can get you the, the more specifications afterwards. I'll make it available as well. Uh, where there's a focus on using computing to understand the cultural material, uh, uh, cult cultural material in new ways. And applications of theories and methods from the humanities, how to interpret the technologies. It's a 50-50 type of thing when you're speaking of digital humanities. Um, then there's in 2021 from the University of Bielefeld in Germany, the digital methods in the humanities, challenges, ideas, and perspectives, where they have very interesting topics and chapters, specifically, the one being specifically navigating disciplinary differences in digital research projects through project management. That's, that's really important. How do you manage these projects of people from different uh, sciences or sub-sciences as such? And then there's also digital research perspectives from different humanities disciplines. Now, then this brings us to the aims eventually. You're involved or will be involved or are involved in research with certain aims, but literature su suggests that, there are, that DH, re DH research should be value-driven. It should add value to scholarly and intellectual events. Thus, scholarly and intellectual value should be promoted. But at the same time, with and or add value to cultural heritage, 
so cultural heritage values as well. Well, to determine, uh, this will determine if this is your approach, uh, it, it will determine what sets of data, what particular data, what particular software would you be using in, in, in the process. Uh, then, as we go to data, we all know the, the saying that what's better than data? More data, and yet more data. That's, that's what it's all about, big data, if we go to that point. But there's a lot of limitations to that. Uh, so, needless to say, it has to be uh, a development of balanced data in terms of text, sound, visuals, or any combination of that. If it's not balanced, the results that you'll end up with could be skewed, it could be data bias, biased. And speaking of data bias, as we're witnessing nowadays in, in the media, for instance, uh, on chatbots, such as ChatGPT, Bing, Bing Chat of Microsoft, and Google's Bard, these are large language models, the so-called LLMs. But LLMs, obviously, if it's not contained, if it's not uh, set up in a specific manner where there's, uh, it could easily, very easily lead to bias, is this the bias of young people of this and this age, of this generation of old people, of male, female. We can go on all the different age possibilities of bias, which comes out in, in, in the research, that the, in the data which you have, whether the data comes from newspapers, from Twitter, from emails, etc. The basic, basic, basic point is keep it balanced. Uh, but on the whole thing of chat GPT, there's a colleague that will be speaking of this later, uh, I think today or tomorrow, at, at this meeting, and which is excellent, the strides that have been made. Artificial intelligence, by and large, is use of language. That's what it's all about. Good. So, what about future? Uh, where are we coming from? What is this? What does the future hold? And uh, perhaps a, a very personal experience which I would like to share with you uh, of change, change taking place, have change that have taken, taken place. Three decades ago, it's about in the 1900s, uh, the, uh, yeah, quite long, uh, universities, institutions of higher education didn't deem it necessary for students in humanities, or whatever, to have access to computers. It was the only the way for engineers, computer science students, and perhaps um, also, also economics. And all of these departments, and I'm now speaking of Stellenbosch in particular, um, developed computer laboratories, so areas where students could, don't, they don't have their own computers, and you have these computer user areas. In 1989, oh, 1999, actually, the Faculty of Arts at Stellenbosch, uh, we had to replace a traditional language laboratory, cassette-based language laboratory. And the question was, where do we go? What's this going to do? 1999, it's a new millennium. We're on there. What's, what's going to happen? Um, and yes, it's, we had a laboratory, a language lab, but that's not a lab lab, as people may think. So the question is, what I consider what happened then was the first wave of technology or technological development of the humanities, education, theology, and social sciences at this university. Uh, as 
the, it led to the setup of a computer area, a dedicated computer area, computer user area, today still known as Humarcha, uh, Humanities for the Humanities, uh, where they have 24-7 access, students have 24 access hours to that. Just following that, very soon afterwards, after these labs were set up of more than 410 work stations were there. Um, the second wave came up very soon after that. And that was, what are we going to do with this? You have students coming in, but they're not, they weren't in a position prior to that to use software. How do you do uh, word processing? Very simple type of things. And it became a point where we had to decide there were special courses to be designed. How do you work with, uh, with software? How do you use Word? How do you use Excel, etc.? And the question was even debated right into uh, Senate of is this uh, going to be credit-bearing courses or not? Just getting people into the, the line. But I would say this is a second wave which we had. And I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we're in a third wave where we have bright students, highly interested, highly skilled in digital methods from three years old, many of them, and coming to universities, they know what to do. But there's new challenges, and the new challenges lies with the edge. Other ways of looking, looking at data, looking at the world around you with some technological support and coming up with new ideas and totally new responses. So, perhaps just as a footnote, <coughs> Yumarcha, which is fully booked for many weeks on, uh, uh, on a normal 24-7 basis, uh, as after the, the COVID, as it dropped significantly the attendance there, and it's to be expected because students have their own computers now and they use their university um, registered software, for instance. So this is a, also a question for building infrastructures as business and industry is also getting. Do we really have need big rooms? Do we really need big buildings for this? However, let me carry on and end off with this into the future, I think, the last decade or so, we've seen the development of totally new infrastructures of another nature in the cloud. Data warehouses, data centers. I'm not going into detail on that. And we're getting into new jobs. Totally jobs that have never existed. And there are so many jobs that are still to come, which we have to prepare ourselves for and prepare our students to get into those jobs. And just a quick Google search for uh, jobs in DH. In the UK, you can get 277. Same in the States, 272. South Africa, not really, not yet. Not so in the front. There's lots of things taking place, but it's not up there yet. And then the other new jobs that come in is in academia. Academia, we need academic departments. We need departments of digital humanities that works together with research, uh, with, with the data centers of the university, works in collaboration with libraries, etc. And if we look at the, the growth in, internationally on the departments in, in the world, DH departments, totally on their own, it's a new wave, totally, as that is concerned. Uh, staff and all levels, from junior lecturers right to professorships. And speaking of professorships, I think we were fortunate to get in Sadilar, in digital humanities, the first professorship in South Africa in digital humanities, which is Professor Menuf van Zane. And we're very glad to have him here to also drive this whole uh, effort, which is currently been doing very well. So, 
We will grow. We will definitely grow. DH will definitely grow. But it's up to you. It's up to us. We have to do this. I thank you. Sorry, I should have pressed that one. If you need any contacts, there's my address, and uh, we can keep in touch if you so wish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. May you please give a hand to Prof. once again. And um, if you have questions, comments, we are ready to take some questions and comments. <laughs> Um, and those who do not know, Prof, actually, they call him, as they call him at Sadilar, the granddad of Sadilar. So he was, he was the founder um, and the first director of Sadilar. So we are very honored to have you today, Prof. Any questions, comments? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Belinda Fester from CPUT. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for that presentation. I think it, it was very useful that you sl simplify your slides for us so that we can focus on the experience that you were sharing with us. Um, there was one thing that I was thinking of when you were saying digital humanities research should be value driven. And then immediately my mind went to the jargon wall because I had a certain expectation as an urban planner of what you mean by value driven and then you went on to say it's adding value and um, my thinking immediately was the the whole idea around value decisions and how uh, value